I'm Joel Migdal. I'm the head of the Jewish Studies program at the Henry Jackson School of the University of Washington. I'd like to welcome you all here tonight. It's wonderful to see such a wonderful crowd here for these lectures. We're going to, we're honored tonight to start by having the president of the University of Washington, President Richard McCormick, say a few words. Thank you, Joel. I appreciate this opportunity to say a few words on the occasion of the Sam Strom Lecture on Jewish Studies. For nearly 30 years, Sam and Althea Strom set a philanthropic example at the University of Washington that few people could match, and their interests were as wide-ranging as their contributions were generous. In fact, there's hardly a program on our campus that has not benefited from their support and their leadership. They gave to medicine, science and engineering, psychiatry, the UW libraries, athletics, art, public affairs, and of course to Jewish studies. 25 years ago, inspired by their desire to create an interdisciplinary Jewish studies program that was both nationally recognized and locally prominent, Sam and Althea inaugurated the lecture series that bears their names. With the inauguration of the lecture series and the Strom's help in funding the first faculty positions in Jewish studies, they effectively established the Jewish studies program at the University of Washington. The program expanded in 1984 when the Stroms endowed a chair in Jewish studies housed in the Jackson School for International Studies. Today, this chair, one of the first endowed chairs established at the University of Washington, is still only one of three chairs in the entire College of Arts and Sciences. It attracts some of the most distinguished scholars in the field. In time, Sam and Althea honored the memory of her late sister, Hazel Cole, with the creation of an endowed fellowship dedicated to the support of graduate students and postdoctoral fellows engaged in Jewish studies. The record of the accomplishments of these individuals has been witness to the intellectual prominence that the fellowship helped recognize and nourish. Tonight, we celebrate Sam and Althea's vision that led to the establishment of the Strom Lecture Series. This series continues to attract to this campus as, for example, this evening, some of the most famous names in the world of Jewish scholarship. And it often culminates in the publication of prize-winning books in the field of Jewish studies. More importantly, the series fulfills Sam and Althea's goal of engaging the broader community with annual cultural events of singular interest. In fact, Sam foresaw the possibilities of the new cyber age and underwrote the cost of having the lectures taped and transmitted via satellite from coast to coast. Today, the program involves students, junior and senior scholars, and the Jewish community worldwide in a great network of support and activities that enhance knowledge of Jewish culture. As you are probably aware, Sam passed away two months ago. Although he is gone from our midst, his influence most certainly is not. What Sam did for this university and the greater community will go on for a very, very long time. It gives me great pleasure to acknowledge the enormous contributions made by Sam and Althea Strom. And equally, and equally, an equally great pleasure to recognize that Althea is with us this evening, as is their daughter, Cynthia. Althea and Cynthia, thank you for being here this evening. You have enjoyed, you have made possible these lectures over the years, and it just gives us enormous pleasure to be in your midst and with you tonight. It is largely due to their efforts that we have a program of excellence in Jewish studies at the University of Washington today. It is an honor to be with you too, and to join in and build upon the legacy they established, they created, they nurtured, they inspired on in the spirit of those inspirations by Althea and Sam and Cynthia, I welcome you to this lecture and uh, expect that you will enjoy it with me. Thank you very much.
We are having the um, lectures taped again, and they will be broadcast. We don't have a schedule for that yet, but you can see the cameras, and we will, uh, if you get in touch with Jewish Studies, we will let you know when they will be broadcast. Also, I'll ask if anybody hasn't done it yet, please turn off your cell phones and beepers. And I want to add to what President McCormick said, my own voice on the role that Sam Strom played and how much he and Althea have meant to the Jewish Studies program. Not only did they give very generously, but they did it in a, a strategy uh, worked out over 20 years ago with Murray Schiff, who was then the executive director of the Jewish Federation and the founding members of the Jewish Studies program. They leveraged their gifts so that those resources could create a state-funded program firmly anchored at the center of what the new field of Jewish studies was becoming nationally. Jewish studies in the United States has developed into a major academic field. It entails an effort to take the special forms of inquiry that had developed in universities, the scientific method, historical criticism, aesthetic and humanistic theories, and apply them to the Jewish experience. In the United States, Jewish studies have concentrated in using these methods in three areas principally. First of all, the study of ancient and subsequent sacred texts in this new method. Second, the study of Jewish history with a particular emphasis on the encounter of Jews with the modern world, what was called out of the ghetto by uh, Yaakov Katz in Central and Eastern Europe particularly. And this is the field that Professor Mendes Flor, who will speak tonight, has made such a mark in. And in the third field was that of Jewish languages, particularly Hebrew, literature, and language. Our first quarter of a century as a Jewish studies program here in Seattle has allowed us to build in these three areas with an outstanding core faculty, including professors Martin Jaffe and Scott Nagel, who have done the ancient text part, Professor Sarah Stein, who has looked at Jews and modernity in Europe, Professor Naomi Sokoloff, who has done Hebrew language and literature. Now, in our second quarter of the century, we are embarking on an expansion to do much, much more. We have a very special opportunity to pioneer in areas still barely touched in Jewish studies programs nationally. And we hope to do two things in, in particular. One, to build a center for Sephardic studies. What better place than in Seattle, especially now that we have been able to secure the best young academic in the country in Sephardic studies, Professor Sarah Stein. And also, second, a center for the study of the American Jewish experience. We already have one of the biggest concentrations of talent in this area, including professors Joe Butwin, who many of you know, Professor Kathy Friedman, who just joined the program, Professor Susan Glenn, Professor Naomi Sokoloff, Dr. Julia Uhlenberg, and Professor Paul Burstein. We have a tremendous concentration of talent in studying the American Jewish experience, and there's not a single center for the study of the American Jewish experience in North America. So I'm very excited about what is happening, not only for the University of Washington and its students, but for the Seattle Jewish community as a whole. Through the Jewish study programs, we have a very special opportunity to make Seattle a center of Jewish research, teaching, and programs in these new areas. The Strom Lectures exemplify the kind of programs we hope to bring to the Seattle community, as does our lecturer this year, Professor Paul Mendes Flor. Professor Mendes Flor received his PhD nearly 30 years ago from Brandeis in modern Jewish intellectual history and Jewish philosophy and religious thought, and since then has been a leading figure at the Hebrew University of Jerusalem. He has interspersed appointments as well at the University of Chicago, where he has a regular appointment now, in addition to that at the Hebrew University, at Harvard, at Brandeis, at the University of Virginia. 
His resume lists 36 books and 177 articles. I feel like such a slacker. <laughs> Suffice it to say that he has been a major force in the interpretation of Jewish thought of the major Jewish thinkers of the 20th century, including Martin Buber, Franz Rosenzweig, and Gershon Scholem. The topics for the three lectures are, the topic for the three lectures is post-traditional Jewish identities. Tonight's lecture is entitled Cultural Disjunctions and Modern Jewish Identities. I give you Professor Mendes floor. Uh, about a decade ago, I received an invitation, I believe it was from Professor uh, Sokolov, inviting me, that was oh, yeah, around 1990 or 91, to come to, uh, to, to University of Washington in the year 2001. Then it seemed so futuristic. It was, it was more like inviting me to go to the moon. Uh, uh, so I feel I'm joining Mr. Tito. <laughs> um, <laughs> but here I am. And, uh, I first wish to acknowledge my uh, gratitude uh, for the very warm hospitality I've already enjoyed. I'm here less than, or maybe just 24 hours, and I've been wined and dined and um, been uh, introduced to your beautiful campus and your spectacular cities. So I'm very grateful. And I'm also particularly uh, humbled by the opportunity to pay homage to a, a, one of the great philanthropists and, uh, and spiritual leaders of the Jewish community worldwide. I've learned of, of your husband, Mr. Strom's activities from a close friend, as you, you mentioned, Yudav Reinhardt and, and elsewhere. And I extend to you my condolences and, and trust that uh, his work will be carried on. Um, uh, so I'm, I'm glad to be with you. I'm going to read my lecture, which is impolite. Um, there's a great German poet once said that, um, I'll say in German and translate it, Sprechen is natur, to speak, to read is natural. Zu hören, to listen, is kultur, to listen is culture. So the cultural burden of this evening is yours, um, uh, so you'll forgive me. And I just also forgive me if I switch my eyes, so to speak. Uh, for this evening's lecture, I've selected two citations to serve as mottos, epigrams, if you wish. Um, two citations which I hope evoke the theme, or rather the tension, in forming uh, this and the subsequent lectures. The first uh, citation is from the writer and Nobel laureate Elias Canetti, a great Spotic Jew. And the citation reads the following. Jews are a people who most widely differ among themselves. <laughs> and the second is from Franz Kafka, who in his diary addressed the question to himself, what have I in common with my fellow Jews? I have hardly anything in common with myself. <laughs> Contemporary Jews variously configurate their Jewish identity. Since the Enlightenment and Emancipation, Jewish identity is no longer exclusively defined by loyalty to the Torah and its commandments. Indeed, formal definitions of identity, membership in a given community, acceptance of its norms, teachings, values, and aspirations are no longer self-evident criteria for contemporary Jewish identity. The ambiguities of Jewish identity in the modern period are, of course, well documented, indicatively often in fiction and in cinema. In this lecture, I will seek both to compound and celebrate the ambiguity by noting that as modern, as, as modern Jews are continuously reconfigurating their identity, Indeed, the Jews of modernity are members of numerous communities, residential, vocational, cultural, professional, political, 
recreational, which are not necessarily conterminous, overlapping, and identical. Moreover, the boundaries of these communities are often fluid. The upshot is that one is no longer exclusively Jewish. For one who wishes to grant his or her Jewish identity salience, prominence, without forfeiting a dedicated membership in other communities, the challenge is to define a Jewish identity that is engaging, yet not exclusive. In these lectures, I shall seek to explore the possibilities of a passionate, yet non-exclusive Jewish identity. A preoccupation with the meaning of their existence as Jews is not unique to the Jews of modernity. Ever since the 75-year-old Chaldean Abraham, the son of Tira, received the divine calling and promise of nationhood, as is recorded in the book of Genesis, Jews have reflected on their identity. Buffeted by agonizing decisions and tests of faith, the founding patriarch of the Hebrew nation was recurrently obliged to question the meaning of his life before God. And so, as it, was, and so it was for his children and his children's children. As the 20th century German Jewish philosopher Franz Rosenzweig observed, and I quote, with other nations, the birth of self-consciousness is the beginning of the end. With us Jews, it is or was the beginning, end of quote. The problem of identity Rosenzweig suggested generally marks for a people the loss of innocence and thus the weakening, if not ultimate, dissolution of its primordial bonds. For Israel, the Jewish people, it is different. However, from its inception as a people, or rather a people of faith, Israel has thematized its own existence. For as the patriarch Abraham already knew, the nation he sired was not simply the anthological means, as the philosopher Herman Cohn once put it, to promote the faith in the one God. Israel's very existence and history were flush with religious meaning. That meaning is suffused in the very substance and rhythms of Israel's temporal life. 19th century Jewish German scholars coined the term Heilsgeschichte, salvational history, to capture this fact. Traditional Jewry was wont, was prone to refer to the image of Abraham's grandson, Jacob Yaakov, who was the first to bear the name Israel. Again, as recorded in the book of Genesis. A name which God bestowed upon him and his descendants after his mis mysterious struggle with the angel. Jacob emerged from the episode blessed with a new name, but also, as it states in the Bible, limping on his hip as a result of an injury acquired in his bout with the angel. The pain and blessing attendant to the struggle are embodied in the name Israel, thus mocking Jewish self-understanding throughout the ages. Recurrently tossed between the poles of injury and blessing, the Jews tended to view the trials and tribulations of their journey through mundane time as raising the question of theodicy, that is, the justification and meaning of God's rule as reflected in their history. As a mirror of the divine presence, Jewish existence thus became the focus of sustained metaphysical meditation and scrutiny. Yet, as the Hebrew publicist and Zionist Ab Achada'am noted prior to, prior to their passage into the modern world, it never occurred to the Jews to ask why they were Jews. And I quote again, such questions would not have been considered, excuse me, such questions would not have only been considered blasphemy, but would have been seen as the highest level of stupidity, end of quote. Before they crossed the threshold into the realm of secular sensibility, the Jews did not question why they were Jews. Despite their preoccupation with the meaning of their collective existence and troubled history, their identity was clear and unambiguous. The parameters of traditional Jew Jewish identity was summarized by Ruth, the Moabite, when upon our conversion to the faith of Israel, she declared, I'm quoting from the book of Ruth, of course, your people is my people, 
your God is my God, and where you die, I shall die. Being a Jew by birth or by choice entails membership in a people, a religion, and in a Schicksalsgemeinschaft, as one says in German, a community of a shared fate. The pivotal element in this statement of allegiance is the faith in God of Israel. Remove it, the faith in God of Israel, and the other elements of traditional Jewish identity begin to totter. For as an eminent scholar of comparative religion has observed, underscoring, underscoring what I've already noted, I quote, to describe Judaism as, a, as the religion of the Jewish people is slightly misrepresenting the situation. Judaism is the religious dimension of the Jewish people. Israel is a people born of and with religion. Accordingly, it is the weakening, if not the utter eclipse of religion that creates the problem of Jewish identity. Sundered from its religious dimension, the peoplehood and the shared destiny of the Jews are beset by ambiguity, a situation which is compounded by the fact that Jews of modernity, at least those who dwell in the diaspora, are integrated in the social and political fabric of the various nations among whom they dwell. Indicatively, Jewish self-reflection shifts from theology to sociology and even psychology. Whereas traditional Jews, excuse me, I, I left Israel when it was, I just left uh, 24 hours ago. We had a Hamsin, which is a desert heat, so I'm still suffering, so L'chaim. <laughs> I should share it with you, but it would be. <laughs> Indicatively, Jewish self-reflection shifts, I said that already, but let's go back. Indicatively, Jewish self-reflection shifts from theology to sociology and even psychology. Whereas traditional Jews would ask, what is the theological meaning of Jewish existence? Secularized Jews would wonder, why I'm a Jew? Should I identify as a Jew? If so, with the loss, if so, how? With the loss of faith and a commitment to fulfill the precepts, the mitzvot, of the Torah, what is the content of my identity as a Jew? To be sure, Jewish theologians have not been unemployed, rendered irrelevant by the modern experience. In fact, since the Enlightenment, they have been a rather active breed. Their task, however, is decidedly different than that of their predecessors. Donning the robes of theologians, ph philosophers, and rabbis have sought to restore Israel's religious faith to revalorize it so that the edifice of Jewish identity and, commit and commitment will endure. These modern rabbis and religious philosophers have had to share the arena of Jewish self-reflection with a battery of secular intellectuals who have offered new paradigms of Jewish identity. Acknowledging the rupture in faith and religious practice brought on by, this, by secularization, they have sought to construct a Jewish identity without a belief in God. Indeed, much of modern Jewish thought has been devoted to devising strategies to foster a Jewish identity simply as membership in the Jewish people and as a Schicksalsgemeinschaft, community of shared fate or destiny. The two, membership and the sense of shared destiny, are not synonymous, however. One can feel oneself as belonging to the Jewish people, but not necessarily accept or acknowledge its fate as one's own. The former sense of membership may be characterized as a sense of ethnic identification, the latter as ideological affiliation. Competing secular ideologies, Zionism, Buddhism, when I practiced this before coming, I, I said Buddhism, which might be true too. <laughs> Competing secular ideology, Zionism, Buddhism, if you <laughs> the Asper nationalism, Yiddishism, have profited various national and cultural conceptions of Jewish identity. Others have appealed to what Theodor Herzl, the founder of Zionism, political Zionism, called negative pride. In the face of anti-Semitism, otherwise assimilated 
Jews should have defiantly affirmed their Jewish identity, a position that was ironically called in German Trotzjudentum, a Judaism out of, out of spite. The French philosopher, non-Jew, of course, John Paul Sartre, had such a position in mind when he stated that it is the anti-Semites who define the Jew. In response to the Holocaust, the philosopher Emil Fackenheim propounded a theolog theolo theologized Trotzjudentum, employing theological language in, and its apodictic inflections, he speaks of the revelatory voice of Auschwitz. This voice commands contemporary Jews not to grant Hitler a posthumous <laughs> victory by assimilating and undermining Judaism by critical corrosive questions. Lest Jews help Hitler after his death and the collapse of the Third Reich achieve the objective of not only exterminating their people, but also their religion and culture. They, the post-Holocaust Jews, are to desist from all actions that might endanger the continued survival of Jewry as a distinctive people and religious culture. Fackenheim also regards the commanding voice of Auschwitz as appertaining to the policies and politics of the State of Israel, especially as pursued by those leaders most jealously concerned with promoting the Jewish state's security. Namely, and he is rather explicit, the right-wing parties. One should, one, what, should one criticize the policy of a Likud government with respect to the Palestinians in the Arab world? In Fackenheim's judgment, one perforce endangers the state and thus possibly contributing to the work begun by Hitler. By grounding his appeal to, the Jew to Jewish solidarity and defiant pride in quasi-theological constructs, Fackenheim betrays not only what I personally regard to be, uh, betrays not only what I personally regard to be a profoundly mistaken, indeed frightening political judgment, his assignment of absolute categorical obligations to the survivors of Auschwitz, and all Jews, he argues, are honor-bound to regard themselves as survivors, also discloses a fundamental predicament facing post-traditional Judaism, namely the difficulty of endowing Jewish identity with a compelling, indeed obligatory quality in the absence of a prescribed content and formal definition, at least a universally accepted content and definition. The difficulty of determining the content and definition of a post-traditional Jewish identity is particularly manifest in the state of Israel. Having the legal obligation of providing a juridical definition of who is a Jew, the state encounters an inevitable antimony, an irresolvable contradiction. Constitutionally bound to correlate Jewish identity with citizenship, the state of Israel must, st must stipulate the formal criteria according, criteria according to which the law would recognize one, that is, an immigrant, as a Jew, and ergo, therefore, entitled to citizenship. Yet, as a secular institution, the state must also acknowledge the, the diverse and divergent conceptions of Jewish identity that distinguished contemporary Jewish life. It is thus not surprising that since its founding, the State of Israel has recurrently failed to provide a satisfactory legal definition of who is a Jew. Although the orthodox elements who dominate the religious discourse of the State of Israel advocate traditional Jewish definitions of who is a Jew based on halacha, halacha or Talmudic law, these inevitably prove problematic because they fail to accommodate both the contemporary social reality of the Jewish people as a community whose membership, whose members are constituted by individuals whose mothers may not be Jewish, the primordial criterion, of course, of Jewishness according to the halacha, or who have, or who have chosen to join the House of Israel through the auspices of reform or conservative Judaism. If one of the founding purposes of the State of Israel, stipulate, stipulated by the law of return, is to provide refuge for anyone who is persecuted as a Jew, then, 
then clearly the halachic definition would exclude the hundreds of thousands of persons of partial Jewish descent who suffered as Jews under the Nuremberg laws, or the hundreds of thousands of immigrants from the former Soviet Union who halakhically are not strictly Jewish. The traditional definition of who is a Jew is also incompatible with contemporary Jewish sensibility. The inadequacy of the traditional definitions of Jewish identity is vividly highlighted by the brother Daniel case and the Shalit case adjudicated by the Israeli Supreme Court in 1966 and 1970, respectively. A Jew by birth and a former partisan who fought in the forests of Poland with his fellow Jews against the Nazis, Brother Daniel converted to Christianity during the Holocaust. As a Carmelite monk, he sought Israeli citizenship under the law of return. His petition was approved by the Halakha, because he was a son of a course of a Jewish mother, which still recognized him as a Jew despite his apostasy. The Supreme Court, however, ruled against Brother Daniel and in effect against the Halakha, basing its decision on considerations of secular and national Jewish sensibilities, arguing that by converting to Christianity, he, Brother Daniel, had removed himself from, and I quote from the Supreme Court decision, the history and destiny of the Jewish community. The Shalit case involved an intermarried couple, an Israeli Jew who had a heroic battle record in defense of the country, and his Gentile wife, who despite the fact that they declared themselves non-believers, sought to have their children registered as Jews by nationality. When the Ministry of the Interior balked, the Shalits turned to the Supreme Court, which ruled that although technically, that is halakhically, non-Jews, their children, the children of the Shalits, should be registered as Jews because they were being raised within the Jewish community of the State of Israel, and as such were indissolubly bound to its destiny sharing its Schicksalsgemeinschaft, if you wish. The Israeli parliament later passed legislation nullifying the Supreme Court's decision and reaffirmed the halakhic definition of Jewish identity. The then socialist-dominated legislature, the Knesset, argued that notwithstanding their sympathy for the Shalits and the countless others in their situation, the Supreme Court's secular definition of a Jew would endanger the unity of world Jewry that unity being assured only by the formal juridical definitions of halakha. This legislation satisfied few but the minority of Orthodox Jews. Moreover, aside from the matter of juridical definition of personal status on Israeli law, the halakha and Jewish tradition have clearly ceased to provide the framework by which the vast majority of contemporary Jews in the state of Israel and elsewhere would identify themselves as Jews. Definitions of Jewish identity by other formal criteria, such as cultural and institutional affiliation, also court ambiguity. Some Zionists fancied that the territorial and linguistic coding of Jewish identity alone would solve the problem. Restored to their ancient patronomy in the land of Israel and speaking Hebrew once again as the language of everyday discourse, it was reasoned that Jews would be Jews such as the French are French. That is, they would be Hebrew-speaking citizens of the Jewish state. And as some Zionists emphasize, irrespective of religious belief or disbelief. This position is likewise buffeted by, amb by ambiguity when one considers that hundreds of thousands of Arabs, Christians, and Muslims speak Hebrew and our citizens of the Jewish state. Ethnic descent being the only distinguishing variable. Within this context, one is reminded of the quip that Israelis are but Hebrew speaking Gentiles. <laughs> this observation, of course, is crude, for it fails to consider the simple but incontrovertible fact that most Israeli Jews would regard themselves nonetheless as Jews. And similarly, that the vast majority of Israeli Arabs 
would understandably uphold their Arab or Palestinian identity. Below the veneer of a shared language and citizenship, Jewish and Arab Israelis are distinguished by ethnic sensibility and distinctive cultural and historical memories, not to speak of a not too subtle sociological and political divide between them. Both in Israel and the diaspora, contemporary efforts to determine a formal, concordant, harmonious, if you wish, definitions of Jewish identity are also continuously falter if, before the fact that as denizens, citizens of the modern world, Jews share in multiple cultural and social identities. As moderns, contemporary Jews are open to other cultures and contrasting axiological and ideological systems. Axiological is a fancy word, I should forgive me, meaning systems of value. And as such, their cultural and cognitive horizons are no longer exclusively Jewish. This is true in the state of Israel as in the diaspora. This situation, which in the past one tended to call cosmopolitanism, but which is more accurately labeled cultural pluralism, Jews naturally share with all moderns, especially with the increasing globalization of culture. The specifics of the Jewish experience of modernity, however, have colored Jewish perceptions of the situation, inevitably confounding all efforts to configure a Jewish identity that takes into account the fact that the modern Jew is no longer exclusively Jewish. Since the, in, the Enlightenment, Jews have adopted the cultures of their host societies, being particularly drawn to the high cultures of Europe and the Americas, with their universal cosmopolitan claims. To be an educated European, for instance, meant to be at home in a variety of ancient and more contemporary cultures. It meant to know languages, disparate literary and artistic traditions, to be open to new ideas, perspectives, and aesthetic sense expressions. The boundaries of high culture thus not only reached back to classical antiquity, but also extended wide and afar across space and time, much of which still remained uncharted. In German, this conception of high culture was known as Bildung, an unending process of intellectual and aesthetic cultivation. And the emancipated Jews of Central and Western Europe were among the most devoted adherents of this ethic of Bildung. Explanations abound as why the Jews were so taken by this conception of culture. Surely it has much to do with the dynamics of emancipation and the political and social conditions of their acceptance in, into the evolving liberal order. What is beyond debate, however, is that the Jews' romance with Bildung often led to assimilation, to a serious attenuation, if, if not loss, of Jewish identity. Hence, it was natural that the, that the acculturation implied by Bildung would be regarded with profound suspicion by many guardians of Jewish tradition. Their apprehensions were evoked not necessarily by the secular inflections, qualities of Bildung, for there were traditional Jews who consciously sought to wed Torah observance with Bildung. I mentioned Shimshon Raphael Hirsch and his notion that um, an educated Jew is, should be also an educated European. It was rather the blurring of the boundaries between Jewish and alien culture, which Bildung seemed to promote, that aroused an often militant opposition to an openness to the other and non-Jewish cultures. Led by the great rabbinic sage Hatam Sofer, who lived in the early part of the 19th century, this sizable community of traditional Jews was con were con convinced that the blurring of cultural boundaries would lead to the demise of Judaism and Jewry. In his last will and testament, which to this very day is the Veda Mechum of ultra-Orthodox Jewry, the book most prized, if you wish, by ultra-Orthodox Jewry, Rabbi Hatam Sofer beseeches all God-fearing Jews to preserve the integrity of Torah true Judaism. He elaborates what he understands by integrity by rendering the Hebrew term for integrity, shalem, an acronym, shin, lamed, hey, uh, shin, lamed, mem. Noting that the first letter, shin, stands for shemot, names. Commenting that, the Jew, that Jews are forbidden to have non-Jewish names one must reject the practice of in, initiated by the enlightenment of calling oneself 
and one's children, Paul, Anthony, Klaus, Martin, Ivan, whatever, uh, Barbara, Judy. Uh, the second letter, Lamed, stands for the Shonot, languages. It is forbidden, according to Rabbi Chatam Sofer, for Jews to learn non-Jewish languages, that is, other than for purely instrumental purposes, going to market to buy tomatoes or whatever, to learn the languages of the others, the others, of the other's community is to enter his or her cognitive universe, a world of thought and value. In the last letter of the acronym, MEM, Hatam Sofer tells us, stands for Malbush, clothing. Jews are forbidden to dress like non-Jews. They must maintain a distinctively Jewish attire. Although pronounced by a learned rabbi, an exegete of God's revealed teachings, this conception of Jewish integrity is unabashedly sociological. By screening out the other's culture, Jews will secure the integrity of their national and religious identity. The scandal of assimilation can only be avoided by social and cultural isolation. Historical experience certainly seems to have vindicated Khatam Sofer. He has hundreds of descendants, whereas Moses Mendelssohn, the first Jew to embrace publicly the challenge of secular culture and its expression as Bildung, a distinction which earned for him the unbridled scorn of Khatam Sofer, has no contemporary Jewish descendants. From this perspective, ultra-Orthodox Judaism must be viewed as a modern Jewish identity. Its dialectical twin is Zionism. The movement for, for Jewish national rebirth was equally obsessed with stemming the tide of assimilation. Rather than the cultural re of the Jews, however, Zionism held that the, in, the regathering of Jews in an ancestral homeland would allow them not only to rejoin the family of nations, but also politically rejoin the nation's family of nations, but also to participate in world culture without courting a loss of ethnic dignity and self-esteem. By creating the sociological conditions for Jewish cultural autonomy, a society in which Jews would constitute the majority population, the revival of Hebrew as a spoken language embracing secular activity and experience and the recasting of sacred sources and memories of Judaism into an, a national literature and historical memory, Zionism seeks to sponsor the possibility of the Jews uninhibited encounter with other cultures unfettered by the fear of assimilation. It's easy to understand that sentence when you read it, but nonetheless. <laughs> I warn you, you have the cultural burden of comprehending my spoken word. Cultural autonomy, as envisioned by the Zionists, therefore encourages the translation of the works of other cultures into Hebrew, and hence their transformation into a Jewish cultural discourse, or at least their integration into the discourse of Jews such that these expressions of non-Jewish experience are free of the structural antagonism to Jewish culture and identity that prevails in the diaspora, where the Jews are a vulnerable cultural minority. Zionism assumed that cultural autonomy under the aforementioned conditions would, eo ipso, spare the Jewish community reconstituting Zion of a scourge of confused identities consequent to participation in various and even contrasting cognitive and axiological systems. The assumption governing the confidence of the, Zi of the Zionists is basically two twofold. Social and linguistic autonomy or separation, a position that Khatam Sofer and his ultra-Orthodox followers would endorse, and a proud affirmation of a national Jewish identity would protect the Jews from assimilation, even when open to the others in their culture. While this assumption is not utterly wrong, the, the mechanism allowing, even encouraging openness to a plurality of cultures and identities is far more complex than contemplated by the Zionists. Typical of other national movements, Zionists oppose the view that there is one essential Jewish identity. Excuse me, I said it wrong. Typical of other nationalist movements, Zionists sponsored the view, endorsed the view, that there is one essential Jewish identity. And here I should note parenthetically that the term identity is somewhat of an anachronism. 
in this context. For it, as a cultural and social, right, social psychological term or category, it entered both scholarly and popular discourse only after World War II, primarily with the writings of Kurt Lewin and Eric Erickson, both incidentally, but perhaps not fortuitously, Jews. Before that, in the Zionist discourse, one speaks of national consciousness and continuity. Be that as it may, the Zionists held that there was one essential and perduring Jewish identity into which one's experiences are gathered and integrated. It was this identity that Zionism came to strengthen and adapt to the secular and political realities of the modern world. This premise, which continues to determine Zionist policy of identity, of Zionist politics of identity, is undermined by the fact made manifest by the ingathering of the exiles to the state of Israel, that phenomenologically there are multiple Jewish identities. The identity of Jews from Afghanistan, Ethiopia, Russia, Poland, and Germany are not homologous, not identical. Indeed, they are often rather disparate, divergent. Furthermore, contrary to the essentialist view of Jewish identity, the various identities one may acquire need not be continuous. In fact, one's involving identities, as well as experiences and social and ideological affiliations, may be radically discontinuous. This fact often engendered a certain anxiety among Jews who feel that their Jewishness should retain salience, lest it be swallowed up in the world of competing identities. Some 90 years ago, the philosopher and social critic Gustav Landauer published an essay on these heretical thoughts in which he boldly challenged his fellow Jews who felt that in order to overcome these perplexities, it would be the best to retreat into a more exclusively Jewish cultural universe. Defending his simultaneous attachment to Judaism and other cultures, he asserted, and I quote, I never felt the need to simplify myself or to create an artificial unity by way of denial. I accept my cultural complexity and hope to be an even more multifarious unity than I am now aware of being." End of quote. The late Nobel laureate Elias Canetti, who we quoted in the beginning, echoed similar sentiments when, during the dark years of the Holocaust, he protested, should I harden myself against the Russians because there are Jews against the Chinese because they are far away, against the Germans because they are possessed by the devil. Can't I still belong to all of them as before and nevertheless be a Jew? As moderns, Jews have adopted as the American Jewish Indologist Wendy Doniger of the University of Chicago has noted in an autobiographical essay, Other People's Myths. As she poignantly, rela poignantly relates, her own journey into the spiritual world of the Indian continent is not to be construed as a mere act of scholarly empathy, but rather reflects a personal quest to expand her cultural sensibilities and humanity. But as Doniger acknowledges, her eager embrace of a multicultural ethic was at the expense of her own primordial Jewish culture, which was re relegated to ethnic and culinary, culinary affections consciously molded, excuse, conscious, consciously modulated lest they becloud her larger commitments. The problematics of living with evolving and ever-shifting identities, especially of post-traditional Jews, are the subject of Woody Allen's cinemographic and satire at Selig, which appeared in 1983, pronounced with a Yiddish accent, Selig. The hero of the film, Selig, portrayed by Allen himself, is so adept at identifying with others that he merely need behold the another, and he instantaneously takes on his or her physiognomy, tonality of voice, and body language. Selig thus becomes a black, a Frenchman, an Irishman, an Italian, a Native American, a Chinese man, and even a Nazi. The cultural uh, chame uh, chameleon, or as some have punned, a chameleon, <laughs> Selig has access to all cultures, but in effect has none. An allegory on acculturation, Alan Selig points to the predicament of syncretism. 
the multiplication, the multiplication of cultural identities leads to their amalgamation and confounding dilution. Here is the possible significance of Allen's counterhero, Tzedek, which in Yiddish, which is Yiddish for blessed, an appellation granted the deceased, which suggests that the film is Allen's eulogy for the, Jewish, the Jews of modernity, who in their mad rush to to be part of other people's cultures have lost a firm grounding in their own culture and identity, thus bringing about their spiritual death. Parenthetically, in fact, our island apparently does not apparently affect the death of the, the spiritual death of the Jews, a fact that Allen apparently does not mourn. Allen's reflections on of course, could extend beyond the specific plight of the modern Jew. They bear upon the inescapable plural character of contemporary identity in general. The often contradictory and centrifugal contri oh, <laughs> thrust of these identities clearly threatens those who wish to secure the integrity of a particular cultural identity. It also troubles those who feel a healthy ego identity should be cohesive, harmonious, and integrative. Postmodern critics of this conception of culture, of cultural and personal identity argue that it is not only out of kilter with the temper of the times, but is fundamentally flawed, for identities are always multi-layered and differentiated. Accordingly, as one critic recently put it, we need a concept of identity that tolerates, and I quote, not only greater complexity, but confusion, chaos, and even nonsense. The confusion and interminable chaos borne by the multiplication of often contradictory identities has a moral fundament. The modern ethos calls upon one to extend one's imaginative and sympathetic faculties to embrace the other and to integrate the other into one's own soul, indeed, to regard the other as a treasured source of self-knowledge. The 19th century American poet, Walt Whitman, uh, Whitman, gave a lyrical evocation of this ethos in his poem, Song of Myself. And I quote from, from this, this passage from this long poet, poem. I am of old and young, of the foolish as much of the wise, regardless of others and regardful of others, maternal as well as paternal, a child as well as a man, through me, many long, dumb voices, voices of interminable generations of slaves, voices of prostitutes and of deformed persons, voices of the, of the disease and of the despairing of the thieves and dwarfs, ring. Do I contradict myself? Very well, then, I contradict myself. I am large. I contain multitudes. From the Jewish perspective, and that of any particularistic culture, the epistemological and ethical challenge of plural identities would be to determine the mechanism that allows us to honor our bewildering and often chaotic, some would say, delectably chaotic assemblage of ever multiplying and subtracting identities while providing a measure of Jewish or cultural specific continuity. In my next lecture, I will speak, I will seek, excuse me, to elucidate such a mechanism. Thank you. Can you take some questions? Yes, certainly. Okay. We'll have some questions. You mentioned towards the beginning of your talk that um, we are a people of a common fate. And so my question is, are we um, more a people of a common fate or more a people of a shared history? Are we one more than the other or are we both equal? Right, of course that's a question of definition, sir. Uh, if you mean by common history means common historical memories, then it's not identical with a common fate. A common fate, but uh, at least as presented by my definitions or intended by my def definitions, would suggest that you, as a Jew, find yourself um, 
bound by that fate and committed to that fate. You accept the challenges, the burdens of that fate. Uh, one of my lectures, I'm not going to do it in the, in, the, uh, in the oral presentation, I'm going to try to elaborate a distinction made by my late teacher, uh, Ben Halpern, who was trained as a sociologist but also had great philosophical um, uh, uh, acuity. He made a distinction between two types of communities, one called mythic and ideological. Mythic means you have certain memories, sensibilities, and the like. Um, ideological communities mean that you, you see yourself as a member of a community that is to serve something greater than yourself, or at least to serve some historical obligation. Um, and his argument was that ultimately the Jews are not simply a mythic community, which can be as understood as shared sentiment and uh, appetites or culinary or gastronomical interests and such, but we're also an ideological community. And that is covered by the term of community of, of destiny. So it's not quite, quite the same as saying you have a his, shared historical memories or a shared past, but we also have a shared future uh, and a commitment towards that future. Uh, Please. The scientific quest is, is an essential, a shared one one that uh, goes on between all cultures seeking a certain type of truth. How does Jewish, a modern Jewish identity stand against that? How does it, uh, it, it seems to me so many Jews are uh, prominent in science, and yet it, it seems to go to me against maintaining a sort of a separateness because they're out in the world and they're testing their ideas against all other ideas in the world. That's precisely the question or, comp uh, or problematic I sought to highlight, um, that we are part of a general community. We're sitting in a university setting. A university, of course, the word university is derived from the term universal. Uh, we are part of a, a universal uh, uh, project. Uh, we lay claim to all cultures as being part of our own experience. All vistas of knowledge are, um, are ours. At least we should uh, honor those vistas. Um, in that sense, um, the university transcends particularity. And yet, uh, while celebrating that universality, we are concerned also with preserving our, our particularity. That tension uh, has, of course, often been articulated as such is part of the modern experience, university and particularity, not only for Jews, but for many uh, uh, specific cultural communities. I understand this community of Seattle is very much concerned with trying to maintain its multicultural fabric, uh, to respect it, to deepen it, while not vitiating or undermining uh, the cohesiveness of the general community. Analogously, that's the question that we're, we're facing. Um, on the cultural level, of course, it means that we are part of, we recognize ourselves to be part of a universal project. Um, we're not only longer Jews, we're not all, we are also Germans, Palestinians. We're not only, me, only men, we're also women. We're not only heterosexual, we're also homosexual. We're not only wealthy and well-to-do, we're also poor. Um, we're all aware of that. Um, that's part of our soul. Our soul is now multi-layered, uh, and we seek to celebrate that. Suggestions that we, theologically, that is even warranted by the tradition uh, that we can discuss in the, in the third lecture. Um,